Hello, I'm Pat McGinty, designer at Metal Arc Audio. This is the first in a series of tutorials on the versatile and powerful Mini DSP 125 and 250 two channel plate amplifiers with integral digital signal processing. Today's lesson introduces the units and explains how to get started. Later lessons will get into more detail and explore some of the techniques we've developed while incorporating these amps into our products. Multiple amp channels on board the speakers, combined with digital signal processing, move us forward into the next generation of high-performance audio. The improvement is not subtle. The old-fashioned pile of components and tangle of wire is fading into the past. Let's take a look at the block diagram and the three basic modes of operation. The analog inputs must first be digitized before they can be processed. The digital stream enters the processor and exits to a pass-through so that you can daisy-chain several units. The processor outputs two channels directly to two channels of amplification. The Mini DSP Power Ice makes a capable stereo amplifier with the added features of parametric equalization and adjustable delay. Just bring your data stream and you can make a stereo. And for added versatility, you can bridge two amp channels to one channel of twice the power. That's handy for power-hungry applications like the powered subwoofer. But for most of our discussion, we'll be working in two-channel mode as used in a two-way speaker with one amp channel driving the woofer or woofers while the other drives the tweeter. You are about to see what wonderful things can be accomplished by using this approach. A quick tour of the hardware before we get started on the software. Input voltage selector. Select this correctly or the unit won't fire up. Optional vol pot. Use it if you like. Most of the time we defeat it in the software. These are your analog ins. Single ended by RCA left and right. Balanced by XLR left and right. We'll discuss how you control the selection and use of these inputs in the software. This input is toggleable in the software from analog input right to digital input. Digital input by AES EBU, or go ahead and use an adapter to RCA and bring SP diff. The unit doesn't care, do it either way. This is the digital output. When you're using multiple units, they must be daisy chained. You can't put a Y in a data stream doesn't work. So you can daisy chain as many as units as you like. I've daisy chained 12 units and it worked just great. Here's your status indicator, self-explanatory, legend here. Network connection. This unit wants to be connected to your local network for programming and you can also use it to adjust volume and uh, presets. Rear of the unit, input board, processor board, two-channel amplifier. The amplifier outputs both channels through a four-pin Molex connector. Quick disconnect, if, you, if the amplifier ever fails, you can replace it easily. I've never seen one fail. Output pair. Left channel, right channel in a stereo mode. Woofer, tweeter in a two channel mode. The amplifier is bridgeable so you can add the two channels of amplification together to produce a single amplifier channel of twice the power, in which case it outputs through the red and yellow connectors. Okay, you're ready to get started with the software. You've connected your unit to your network, downloaded, installed your software, and opened the software. This is the first screen you'll see. 
The first thing we need to pay attention to is whether or not we're connected to the unit. Here's a box that says now connected to, and no, we're not connected to anything. And this is something that'll come up over and over again as you use the unit. You must deliberately go ahead and select the unit. First time you connect to any configuration, you'll see this screen giving you a choice between uploading the, your desktop file to the board, resetting it to factory defaults, or, or working with the program that is already on the board. This is very helpful if you're addressing a board that you're not sure what has been written to it. You can select this, and this is what you'll usually do, and you'll see what is on the board. In this case, it doesn't matter because it's set to factory default. Okay, your first screen. We're connected to Power Ice. It has a unique IP address. You'll see that our levels are set to minimum so that we don't start by doing any damage. And that there are arbitrary crossovers here intended to protect the drivers. A low pass for the woofer, a high pass for the tweeter. You'll adjust all of these things as you program your unit. Now the unit is named Power Ice, but it's if you're going to be using more than one unit, you can't have multiple units with mul with the same name because you won't know which unit you're addressing. So we're going to go right ahead and change this to the unit's actual name. Sig oops. Signet left. Okay, we push enter. We're going to be prompted to reboot. Go ahead and power cycle the unit. Tell it OK. And now it's called Signet Left. Quick tour of the control of the controls. There are four configurations. Each configuration is independent from the other configurations. Each configuration is saved as a separate file when you save the, or load the files. You can control your master volume, the little pot on the back panel, disable, make the pot active, ADC mode, or you can control it remotely uh, through your network. Most cases you'll use disabled. Mute the entire unit, unmute the entire unit. Let's take a look at the analog inputs. Most of us are going to use the digital input, but the analog input has a few things about it that we need to know. In stereo mode, it brings left channel and right channel into inputs 1 and inputs 2 from the rear panel, left input, and right input. Of course, they're processed separately in output through output 1 and 2. The inputs work the same way when you bridge the unit. You can bring left channel into the left channel input, input 1, right channel into the right channel input, input 2. They're mixed and summed, combined to a single channel. If you're using your unit in two-channel mode and intend to use it as either a left or right channel driving the left or right woofer and tweeter, you must bring your analog signal into the left channel input on the rear panel. In this mode, the right channel analog input is disabled. The thing you want to realize is that the only time that the right channel input on the rear panel, input 2, is active is when you're operating in stereo mode. Okay, let's take a look at the digital input. It comes in on the same connector used by the right channel balanced audio input. The thing we want to understand about the digital input is that the data stream, either SPDIF or AES-EBU, 
is a data stream that contains both left and right channels. So when we bring one data stream in, we can instruct our software either to use the left channel or to use the right channel or to add the left and right channel together or to use both left and right channels in stereo mode. The configuration tabs give you a powerful method of streamlining your development because they allow you to build and compare four designs at once. Now, Because each configuration saves as its own file, if you're building a stereo pair, you'll, you'll have a possibility of having eight files. So a tidy file naming system is critical to get started. I name mine by date. Today's date 092318. We're on configuration one. Left speaker. Okay. Now if I want to take this configuration and move it to another configuration tab so that I can go ahead and build on it, change it, make something to compare, we simply select another tab. Go ahead and load that file. Okay, so now on Signet left, configuration one and configuration four are identical. We can go ahead and let's say change configuration four, switch back and forth and audition them to compare between the two. We can also move configuration, uh, Signet left configuration one to, let's say, the, the right speaker. Here we are on Signet right configuration one. We can load the file. Okay. Now Signet left and Signet right are identical. Of course, there's a problem. They're both playing the left channel. So now we can audition in stereo. Let's take a look at our control panel. Now we've loaded the file for our Signet speaker. It's showing up in the now connected to. We know we're ready to go to work. Now every change we make is will happen in real time. So if we're putting a signal through the system, let's say we're listening to music, we will hear the changes we make immediately. So we need to be a little careful. This is our input level. This is analogous to input sensitivity. This is handy when you want to limit how loudly the speaker can play overall. And these levels are used to adjust the relative level of the drivers. Typically tweeters are more sensitive than woofers, so usually you'll see something like this. At the heart of the matter is the crossover. Two filters for each crossover a high pass filter and a low pass filter. In this case for a woofer we've high passed this woofer at 30 Hertz using a Butterworth second order filter. You'll see that Butterworth filters are available from first order all the way up to eighth order. Linkwoods Riley, of course, starts at second order. And we have them available all the way up again to eighth order, plus there's a Bessel. In this case, our tweeter uh, filter is simply a high pass at 2200 cycles at 30 dB per octave with the uh, low pass filter bypassed. Each channel has its own PEQ. I use the output channel PEQ to equalize the individual driver before I apply the crossover. And then I use the input PEQ as the global PEQ to adjust the overall tonality of the speaker and adjust it to the room. 
In the case of the Cygnet, we're giving it a little help at 60 cycles with a peak. And we're suppressing a little bit of the output above 500 cycles with a high shelf. So I'll show you how those work. A peak. We can have positive gain, negative gain, adjustable frequency, adjustable Q. So you can use this as a boost or a notch. Bypass. Low shelf. Pretty much just what you think. Boost, cut, Q, frequency. High shelf, mirror image of the low shelf. And sub EQ is a special case low frequency equalizer that requires a little bit of additional processing so it eats up the 12th bike quad. Frequency range is maximum of 50. Essentially what you have here is a low frequency peak. So let's just go back and look at our work all together. Ooh, that's ugly. Mute is excellent when you want to audition just one channel. It's critical when you're setting up a filter to listen to the woofer and tweeter independently. Invert, self-explanatory. Your drivers probably don't invert. You could wire them incorrectly and have to invert. Compression is a way to limit the peak output of your amplifier. There are settings for threshold and ratio. Also the time constants for attack, hold, and release. This is a complicated feature that takes a little while to learn, needs to be used sparingly and gently, but will help you build a speaker that is robust. Delay per channel. Here we have a two-way with a woofer and tweeter on a vertical baffle board. So just as you would expect, the tweeter is acoustically out ahead of the woofer. And we found that 0.16 milliseconds of delay on the tweeter aligned it correctly with the woofer. Learn to use all of these tools and you'll be making beautiful sounding speakers. Thank you for watching. We hope that was 19 minutes packed with valuable information for you. If you think so, please visit our websites and subscribe. Thank you. Bye.